Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard. The Inside Analog Photo radio program is all about the traditional photographic process. We talk about all aspects of analog photography, including the hybrid workflow. You can find out more information over at www.insideanalogphoto.com. And of course, Inside Analog Photo is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. These guys have the coolest instant photography materials known to mankind. They have, of course, the pack film and three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five, color and black and white. They have the Instex systems in the wide format, the Instex 210 camera and film, and of course, the Instex Mini in the Instex Mini 7 and the Instex Mini 25, both in color film. Beautiful stuff. There's nothing cooler than instant photography. You get a print because if you don't have a print, you don't have a real photograph. This is great fun stuff. This is great for art. This is great for business. This is cool stuff. You definitely want to check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends over at Photo Publicist, providing worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development for the photographer, turning photographers into celebrities. You can find out more information over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the highest quality work known to mankind anywhere on this planet. Unbelievable developing, scanning, and of course, output on high quality Fuji Crystal Archive. Unbelievable cool stuff these guys are up to. And remember, you don't have a photograph unless you have a print in your hand and you need to print your pictures. This is important. You need to supply proof to your customers and even print your own work because it's not about looking at it on a monitor. It's about holding a print in your hand. Definitely check these guys out at Richard Photo Lab, of course at richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5, DR5 Chrome, black and white, developing that turns your black and white neg into, that's right, black and white chrome. Unbelievable stuff, www.dr5.com. Our friends over at Upstrap, at upstrap-pro.com for the camera strap that will not slip off your shoulder, guaranteed bar none, the coolest strap around. Our friends at Iger Studios for the finest quality drum scans known to mankind, Iger Studios. Dot com. Our official media partner, APUG, the analog photography user group for all things traditional photographic process on the web, www.apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, International Museum of Photography and Film over at www.eastmanhouse.org. Today on Inside Analog Photo Radio, we're going to be here with Susie Barron. Susie is a wedding and portrait photographer out of Austin, Texas. She's got a great website, beautiful pictures, a lot of cool stuff, a killer blog with new photos every day. She's so inspirational. Great stuff going on with Susie. Susie, how's it going today? It's going great. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photography. Great to have you on the program this week. Talk about yourself, your photography, your use of film, and all this beautiful stuff you're doing. Thank you. I'm honored to be on the show. So, Susie, let's chat about yourself and how you got into photography before we get into what you're doing currently and what you like to shoot. So tell me about how Susie got involved in wanting to be a photographer. Well, my brother had a camera and he stopped using it and I started using it. And then I started doing little still life setups. They're really funny. They're like pictures of dolls and seashells and stuff. And then I was always taking pictures of friends, but I didn't know you could do it for a living. So I had a lot of other really odd jobs before I ever became a photographer. I remember when I finally decided, hey, I'm going to do this, I told my mom, and she was like, oh, like at JC Penney's? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I was working in a lot of photo labs. That was my background. I was printing for a lot of big-name photographers on the West Coast. I was a professional fiber printer for years and a color printer. One of the benefits of working at a lab is you got free film and processing, and you got free access to the darkroom. So, of course, I was doing a lot of my own stuff. And one day I just woke up and said, hey, why am I working in the lab? Why don't I just go out and shoot? So then I just decided, okay, I'll go back to school. And I did that. I got a BFA, so I was training to be a fine artist. And then I realized that meant that you had to go on a lot of interviews and panels and you were going to be basically pretty poor. I remember thinking, oh, that's not what I want to do. And meanwhile, I got asked to shoot a wedding. I was pretty much a tomboy, listened to a lot of punk rock. And I was like, a wedding? Ah, I'm not going to do that. But the person persisted. The person who wanted me to shoot his wedding was my ex-husband. So he was my first client. I photographed him getting remarried and realized not only did I have fun, I was really great at it. I had been doing a lot of street photography, which is reportage, basically taking candidates as they happen. 
and I'd been doing all these still lives for years and years, and it just was a perfect mesh of my abilities. That's interesting that your first client was your ex-husband. That's cool. Yeah, he was really funny. He said he was going to make me a name tag that said ex-wife. Did he or no? <laughs> no, but her family kept coming up to him and saying, wow, that photographer, she's a great gal. You should hold on to her. <laughs> so they had no idea who I was. Right. Yeah, but big vote of confidence. He and I are really good friends, and I really do think that that was a great gesture on his part to support me like that. No, that's cool, though. Very cool. Yeah. Let's talk about the other stuff that you've done that maybe has had an influence in your photography itself. So tell me about growing up in Idaho. Do you think that's had any influence in your photography? Yes, I definitely think it had an influence. I always tell people that movie, Napoleon Dynamite, they just nailed it. That was my childhood. And while everybody else was sitting on the couch laughing, I was sitting there with my jaw dropped, kind of going, wow, they got it. And actually, there's a girl in that film who's a photographer, and I was pretty much that girl, so that kind of cracked me up. But I found photography was just a way to express myself. I felt kind of oddball in Idaho. I didn't really relate to people. My senior year, when we were registering for school, we were in the gym, and I was supposed to sign up for physics and calculus. And I don't know what got into me, but I walked over to the yearbook and signed up for two hours of photography instead. And my mom went through the roof, but I had a blast. And that was the start for me, where if you look at my nags, you could see where before I was just goofing around, I got lucky. All of a sudden, everything became very standardized and predictable, and I could get the exposures I wanted. And I had a great time in the dark room. My love of dark room came in there. And then right after high school, I moved to France for a year, and I shot tons of film there. I had a great time came back and moved to California. And then I was in school and I wanted to declare an art degree. And my parents were like, no, no, you have to do business. And so I just got derailed and didn't get to do that. Ended up dropping out and doing a lot of crazy slacker jobs for a number of years. Tell me about the Conehead gig. I worked as an extra quite a bit just to pay the bills. I don't really have any acting abilities. And a lot of times that they would be filming a scene and they'd stop and they'd stare at the extras the crowd and they look puzzled and then they point at me and they go, you move over off to the side and they clear me out of the picture. So I'm probably a really bad actress, even as an extra. <laughs> but when I heard about the Coneheads gig, I was like, oh, that'll be fun. What's really interesting is there was a hierarchy of cones. There were people who actually got cones glued to their heads and you could see their face. So they were the A cones and I was a C cone, which I had a mask on. So I was way, way down there. But we got to hang out for a couple weeks with Dan Aykroyd, and it was just fun to be on the Paramount lot. I actually really like being in stimulating environments like that, which probably explains some of my other jobs that I've had. I was a Zamboni driver. I was a tour manager and photographer going around the country one summer in a giant toaster, which was actually an Airstream with two giant pieces of toast on top and a professional kitchen inside. So I've always sought out really interesting things. I don't think I can do a desk job. I've done it, and it just doesn't suit me as a person. No, I think that's cool, and I think these type of things have formed your style when it comes to your photography. Yeah, I definitely have an eclectic way of looking at things, and it's funny because I've always been that way, and when I first started in weddings, it was still a little bit stodgy at the time. People weren't doing crazy things. And from the get-go, I was shooting things very differently from everyone, and people loved my work. And I was very much in demand just for that alone, just because I had a different way of seeing the world. Do you find that getting a Bachelor in Fine Arts and Photography has also molded you as a photographer? Absolutely. Uh, one thing that I did when I got to school, they didn't have the newest computer equipment. Not many schools did at the time. I didn't go to a real fancy photography school. So I got there and the equipment was sort of lacking and I said, well, I'm going to take some art history classes. I'm going to teach myself about content and composition. And I ended up taking like five more art history classes than you'd ever need. And it really has informed how I shoot. I'm always referencing things from art history. And in fact, I'll say that I know a lot of people look to other wedding photographers for inspiration, but I'm constantly looking at other sources like Vanity Fair and Vogue. I look at Dwell Magazine. I look at magazines that have nothing to do with the wedding industry. And I always find that it's part of how I came up with my style in addition to my interesting life experiences. I think that's a big thing about learning about the history of photography. And then if you don't know where photography has come from, then you don't yep. know even where you're going. Yep. So it's quite interesting when you start looking at the history of photography and people are thinking, well, who cares what some old dude did? 
Yeah. Well, it's funny. I know around the turn of last century, there was this whole movement called pictorialism. And it was very much like ethereal. And there was a lot of halation in the images. And that's what I saw about three, four years ago with digital. Since the images weren't looking great straight out of the camera, people were running all these actions. And if you look at stuff from three or four years ago, if you flip through any old magazines from that time period, everything has been photoshopped and has all these crazy, the people look like they're angels. And I kind of laughed. I thought, okay, I know when those people look at their images 20 years from now, they're going to cringe and they're going to go, oh, that's so 2004. The problem is that most of it still looks that way. Yeah, I actually really do try to keep things very classic and timeless. And with film, that's easy. It's straight out of the camera. It's beautiful. And you don't feel this need to do any of that. When I'm editing, I'm looking for things like, oh, he has a little bit of razor burn. Let me just fix that for him. Or, oh, I'm just going to crop this image slightly. And that's about the extent of what I'm doing. I do have to admit that your food photography is fabulous. Oh, thank you. I like hearing that. I kind of stumbled across food and I'm a total foodie. So that just works for me. In fact, that's a lot of what's on my blog. I always have pictures of food and make people mad because it's the first thing they look at in the morning and they immediately get very hungry. No, I mean, this stuff's fabulous. It's got very shallow depth of field. It's got very yummy pastel colors. I don't know what you shop the stuff with that I'm looking at here. And I'm actually trying to set up a workshop for a culinary school where I can help beginning chefs learn how to prep the food for a photo shoot because there's so much that they don't know. And I've shot two cookbooks and I'm hopefully going to shoot many more. I really enjoy doing that. And there's a lot of stuff that you have to keep in mind, especially when you're shooting so close. And I know that there have been a lot of trends in that area, too. I remember about maybe three or four years ago, suddenly everything was an overhead view. And it had been a three-quarter shot for quite a while, and now it's overhead. And then it got messy. It's funny. I just did a cookbook where the stylist was very upset. She's like, yeah, food's all messy nowadays. I just don't like it. And I laughed. So, I mean, it's like with anything, trends come and go. I know right now in the wedding industry, there's a lot of off-camera lighting, and I'm waiting for people to start gelling their lights. That's the next thing. Bringing that up and just sort of bouncing off the wall here, but I've been looking at a lot of images here lately. I I look at stuff every day. Yeah. And I'm looking at some stuff, and I'm seeing that I find now there's too much flash. Yeah. People are losing the ambiance of a reception in a wedding, and especially when you get stuck into some little reception room at a hotel. Okay, and you got four walls and carpet, and then they try to gel it and light it so it looks cool. And then a photographer comes in and brings in the sun. And guess what? All the ambiance is gone, and it looks horrible. Yeah, I've been trying to incorporate that in, but I have not been happy. And my other solution to that has been to go crazy shooting high-speed film. And I have been getting some really moody, beautiful shots. Of course, I can't drink coffee before I go do that because you can't have any shake. You're getting down to a quarter of a second. (laughs) Right. Yeah, I really have been in love with that and have been trying to do that more and more. And even, I dare say, I've been bringing tripods, which I used to be, no, no tripod. But now I'm using that. And actually, I find that a lot of my gear is in flux, but not because of trends. It's because I'm always trying to improve things. So I have been aware that there's been a lot of flash. I've seen it. And I've even seen a lot of portraits with flash that are feeling too harsh to me. And I kind of know that it's a look that people, maybe they're a little infatuated with. But I feel like for a portrait of yourself on your wedding day, it's almost a little too gritty. I actually do tons of gritty urban type of portraits for weddings. But for some reason, the flash is just feeling a little too contrived to me. You bring that up. I was looking at some stuff today and here's these nice portraits they're doing for the wedding stuff. But a lot of flash, shot on digital, so sterile, so real in your face, it wasn't pretty. Yeah. I think sterile is the word. Yeah, I find that a lot. I think people get really enamored of being super technical, and then they lose the soul. I have to say, that's something about film. It always has soul to it. And I get people saying to me a lot when they talk to me on the phone or they meet me, they're like, your stuff is so different. And I don't know why. I can't figure it out. And I'm like, I know why. It's partly my style, but it's also just how film looks. It's so lush and rich. And I just find the way the lenses capture on film versus lenses capturing on digital sensors is very different. And here's the thing. Literally, I played with a D3S a few weeks back. Yep. I was shooting at night in literally darkness. I could barely even focus on stuff myself. And that camera, when it pops up on the back of the LCD, looked like daylight. It was beautiful. It wasn't noise. It was like grain. But here's what. These guys that shoot this digital stuff must be still stuck in the head of ISO 100 
and they turn on enough flash power to melt the sun. Yeah. Just like, dude, turn the ISO up. Don't use flash. I'm not anti-digital, and I use it for certain things, and I have to say I have been very enamored of the high ISOs, and you kind of just get this crazy grin on your face when you see the results on the screen. You're like, wow, check that out. So I think it really is just a trend right now to do off-camera lighting. I think that's just what is in. And there's a lot of workshops going around to prove that. I think I get one once a week in my email offer for a workshop about that. This is true. I'm still digging this food photography here. I don't know what you shot that deal with the lemon slices with a little hors d'oeuvre piece. I don't know why it looks so inviting. It's soft, but it's so crisp. It's film with natural light, and I created my own softbox. We actually shot that at the chef's house under the Hollywood sign, and I always joke with him that that dining room has the magic light. And I always ask him, can I come out and just shoot pictures in your dining room? No, it's great stuff. Now, what did you shoot this with? Oh, gosh. I'm going to say it's 400. It might be 100, but I actually don't shoot a lot of anything below 400. I'm a real nut about 800 speed film. I almost always shoot 800 speed film, and I know that Fuji is discontinuing their 800Z. What are you going to do now? I guess I'm going to shoot 400 and push it, which is fine. It does really well, and that's cool. But I just love 800. I literally shoot with that, even personal work, all the time. And because I travel and I never know what I'm going to be, it's just way more versatile. If I pop a roll of 160 in there, chances are all of a sudden I'm in a restaurant and I want to shoot a picture of whatever I'm eating. I'm like hand-holding it down to like a second. So, yeah, I'm a big 800 speed fan. So you're thinking 800Z now. You would shoot this at what? Normally 400? Yeah, yeah, I overexpose a lot, yes. One two, to two stops? stops. Really even yeah. two? Yeah, two stops. I'm chronically overexposing. That's something I've been doing for years. And it was funny, I talked to Jose Villa one day. I don't know how, and we both just realized we both did that. And we're like, hey, that's a really funny thing when you find out the things that you've been doing that just worked for you, you find out that's what other people are doing too. Now, how much do you find that you can go underexposed with the 800Z? Do you ever shoot it at 16 and then oh, hope but for I the know best? It's very forgiving, although I really don't like underexposed images. And what I try to do when I don't like something is then I try and do it on purpose to see. So that's one of the things I've actually been working on. That and I spend a lot of time at weddings getting beautiful backgrounds and everything perfect. And lately I've been seeing that when there's something out of place that I don't like and I'm trying to exclude it, I'm finding I need to include it. And so I always try and think, well, whatever I'm rebelling against or really butting my head against something, I actually turn it around and try and use it to my advantage. So I have been underexposing. I did some first dance pictures on 800 speed in very low light, and the color temperatures were beautiful. I was stunned by it. So that inspired me to keep going with that. No, I think that's very cool. Now, do you shoot any chrome? I don't. Although it's funny, everybody keeps giving me their film, and I have a ton of 100 VS in my fridge. So I will be shooting a little bit of chroma, and I would cross-process it, except that 100 VS, I've had a lot of trouble. It's so contrasty when you cross-process it. It's been very difficult. I also should say, somebody gave me a bunch of Kodak Super 800 from probably the late 90s, and that's in my fridge. And I shot a couple rolls with that. A friend was having a sushi-making party, and the grain was ginormous. It looked like people had little creepy crawlers running across their faces. And I laugh because I shoot so much 800, I just assumed, but we forget how far film has come. And I'm grateful that both Fuji and Kodak are still making technological advances. I think Kodak just came out with Ektar 100, which is funny. I used to shoot that film when I was in junior high. So I thought that was funny that they brought it back and it's super improved. It's amazing. Yeah, no, I think the technology is getting better and there's still 800Z in the pipe and people can get it and pork it up. Now, have you played with Portra 800? I love Porch 800 too. Yeah, I love both of them equally. It's really hard for me to choose between the two. It's funny, like I said, like anything that seems to be a problem, I just spin it to my favor. So if 800Z gets discontinued, then I will just find other ways to get the effect that I want. So it'll just make me be more creative. Do you find you shoot the Kodak less overexposed than the Fuji? No, I shoot them both the same. Really? Um, Yes, I do. I try not to overthink that stuff because I'm more worried about what's happening in front of the camera. So I know my gear really well, and I tend to be, I don't want to say I'm on autopilot, but I just know. In fact, at one point, I tried to switch to Canon, and I had the worst time because all the gears, everything's opposite. There's this big dial on the back that my nose kept hitting, and the lenses, everything goes on the opposite. So while I love their cameras, I just was like, wow, this is really not intuitive for me. 
So I just went back to Nikon and I know everything really well. And I had one shooter at a wedding who kept asking if he could push film. And I was like, no, because you're trying to keep track of this stuff. Meanwhile, there's a circus going on around you. So I really put my foot down and he still ended up pushing five rolls and we still tease each other about that. But I really try to keep that part unencumbered so that I can focus on my couple. Now you go into a gig and you only take 800. That's it? No, okay. I'll bring 400 and I'll bring Neo 1600 and I'll bring 3200. And I stumbled across, I think it's the Acros 100. I thought that film was sensational. But as I said, it's really hard for me to want to put that in a camera unless I know it's an outdoor wedding for the entire day. Yeah, you just need a lot of light, even though you can underexpose that massively, but depends on how you develop it. The problem being is a lot of people that don't shoot weddings don't know that shooting film, just yeah. keeping track of three different emulsions or four and switching in this and then this body and that body and then resetting yep. this and setting this and it gets to be a bummer. I could really dig going in and just saying, okay, I'm only going to shoot 800 a day and that's it, man. But then 400H is just so beautiful. Yes, but a lot of weddings, I average 40 rolls. And I would say at least 20 of those, if not 30, are 800. Now, I'm a huge 800 junkie. I really am, I have to say. I, Elizabeth Messina made that announcement at WPPI that 800Z was not going to be made anymore. I was in the third row going, no, no, you can't do that to me. There's still a lot out there. So I guess the thing is, is to pick up an economically priced freezer from Craigslist yeah, and start yep. packing it full of film. There you go. Yeah, I definitely am going to do that. I know when AGFA, they discontinued their RSX 50 and 100, I used that film for cross-processing and I loved it. I went and bought as much of that as possible. I still have some of that in my fridge. Wow, cool. Uh, Let's talk about gear. You had mentioned Nikon. Tell me, what are you shooting with? When I started, I did all 35 millimeter and I shot Nikon F100s because my hands are so small. I would shoot an F6 in a heartbeat. But the funny thing is, is the F100s are about $350 on eBay. So I'm always picking those up for real cheap. I have very little expense there. And then I had this Bronica that I won for a scholarship. And I said, oh, I'll bring it to the wedding. I shot one roll and it was sensational. Absolutely blew my mind. I shot with it all the time for personal work, but it never occurred to me to lug that along with me. So I shot with that for a couple of years. And then last November, I finally said, all right, I'll get the contacts. And that has just radically changed my life and made me so happy. And I'm actually shooting so much medium format now and loving it. Really beautiful. So tell me about the glass you like with your contacts. I shoot with the 80. And I was thinking about buying other lenses for it, but I already have so much gear that I carry. So something that I do, it's sort of my dirty little secret. I don't ever tell people this, but I'll put a close-up filter on the front of my 80 so I can shoot close-up details of stuff. Which one are you using? The Canon close-up filter? No, black and white is the brand, and I think it's a plus two. Oh, cool. And it's literally the screw-on filter that goes on the front. That's from back in the days when I was a student. I was super poor. I would pick up a set of three close-up filters for like 10 bucks and use them. But the funny thing is, is people often said to me, wow, there's a crazy look that you have to your stuff. And I'd be like, yeah, I think I know what that is. I did that, and I'll use that for 35 too. I have close-up filters for my 35, but I shoot with a 60 macro Nikon. They call it micro lens. I use that for a lot of close-up stuff. And then I have a 50, so I have a 50 and a 60. So kind of close in focal length, but serving very different purposes. It's a 50 1.4, and I love the 70 to 200. I use that lens so much. I use it for personal work, too, when I feel like lugging it around with me. Yeah, there's something with the contacts. It's an incredible rig. Yeah, it's definitely not discreet. So I will take that out. Like a couple of days from now, I'm just going to go on a garden tour here in Austin. I'm just trying to decide what to bring. And I think I'm going to bring the contacts, even though it's not small. And it'll be obvious that I'm shooting. But normally, if I'm out shooting for myself, I'll take an old Nikon FM2. And the beauty of that is people think I'm a tourist. And worse, since I'm shooting film, they think I don't know what I'm doing because who shoots film? So I get into a lot of interesting places where they wouldn't normally let you bring a camera, and I get to shoot a lot that way. That camera is pretty small, not small like the digital cameras people carry around with them, but I'll shoot with that quite a bit with a 50 on there. I've been trying to shoot a Zeiss 21 and trying to get used to shooting wide. I remember when I was a teenager, I shot with a wide all the time because of the crazy angles and distortion, and I got away from it. So now I'm just trying it out again and seeing how I feel about it. Yeah, I haven't really got into the wide myself as well. I try to keep 50, uh, 35, yeah. and 85, and then, yeah. of course, with the contacts, well, the yeah. 80. Yes. 
And I'm the same way. I'm thinking, wow, you know, I really want that 140 or the 120, but I'm like, I don't know. Well, it's a lot more lens changing. And the other thing, when I say my gear is in flux, I had been using since like 2000, I'd been using a 28 to 70 zoom and I sold it two weeks ago and I sold it because I knew if I kept it, I wouldn't push myself. And I'm switching to all primes. And I shot a wedding and was like, oh, lens change, lens change, lens change. I couldn't believe it. The only reason I felt I could do it is I've been doing this long enough that I know how to handle a wedding and it wouldn't be a distraction. Even though I try to keep things very much on autopilot, I was like, yeah, I can do this. But it was interesting. Like there are things you can't shoot with a wide. You just can't walk up and do a portrait of someone with a wide. It's not going to look good. And details, I'd walk up to details and you just can't get close enough. So I was trying that out, seeing how I felt about it. And we'll see. I've gone through the whole thing. I've stuck with Prime now and 50 millimeter or a 40 on a Leica or somewhere in that range. And basically that's the same when you're shooting the contacts in 80s like a 50. So it it just seems to be about the right focal length. And I think, didn't they figure out that the human eye sees it around like 40 millimeters or something? Somewhere around there. I believe it. I actually tell people, I think that's why I've been shooting food and I'm shooting things that are like three, four, five feet away from me. And the other reason is, is I'm blind. So I have glasses and uh, landscapes for me are very tough. I don't quite perceive them. So I got the wide. I'm trying to push myself. I think it'd be an interesting experiment to see what I come up with there. I also shoot with a range of old cameras and vintage cameras. I have a Russian panoramic camera. So I was just thinking because of wide, that's very wide. And it's a pan, I can't remember the name of it. It swivels, it's 180 degrees. It's got a swing lens. A swing lens, thank you. It's a swing lens. So it does interesting things to the horizon. And of course, it gets people really excited when you bring it out. I shoot with that and an old brownie. I shoot with Holga's. I shot with a Nikonos underwater camera a lot. I've just really had a lot of fun with it. Tell me about your wedding stuff. You really like to grab details. And I think it's so yeah, cool I, how much detail stuff. Now, I don't know, are you shooting this because do you figure the bride wants a lot of detail? Do you figure that for submission for publication that they want more details? What do you typically shoot volume-wise of detail versus other stuff? Oh, wow. I really do love details. And I second shoot a lot for my friends and we'll swap weddings if we're not booked. And a lot of times they just have me shoot details. They'll just make me go crazy with that. I really feel like people, whatever their budget may be, whether they're having a big fancy event or something simple, they've really thought about what kind of atmosphere they want and they'll never remember it. It's such a blur. And I even had a bride who said, she's like, I don't want pictures of the food. And I was like, oh, what did you hire me? So I actually took all those pictures and afterwards she was just grateful. She was like, thank you so much. I mean, I love the emotions and the family photos, but all those little details, she's like, I barely saw them. So I really feel it's important. And then, of course, for submissions, I found that that's super important. I actually will show up now outside of my contract time and shoot a lot of stuff for myself. And I even tell people, I'm like, if you see me, I'm just prepping. So don't interrupt me and I'll show up for the getting ready. And I do a lot of pictures. I'll do a lot of architectural details. I really believe that you can't get enough of that stuff, especially for blog submissions. No, I think if you look at blogs and if you look at magazines, about 80% of the images are details. And there's like two or three of the bride and groom, maybe. And that's it. And the rest is details. And I think that brides are more interested in details than in seeing Joey's wedding or whatever. They don't care about the bride and groom. They want to see about their details and their venue. Oh, and what they use for flowers and what they use for this. Yeah, we laugh about that. Sometimes I'll have a consultation and the people, instead of looking at my photography, they're like getting ideas for their bouquet. But I think it's hard for people to look at pictures of other people that they don't know and place themselves in it. And I think that's why. And I also know a couple different major blogs have told me they don't want any nighttime pictures, anything that's dark. They're just not going to show that. They want light and airy and beautiful stuff. And that actually, it's funny because that's my style. I do shoot light and airy. So that's one reason that I've been shooting a lot of that stuff. And I know that's what they choose. And then they want, of course, the portraits of the bride and groom that look like portraits, but they look spontaneous, but they're posed. Let's talk about labs. You used to work at a lab. You've dealt with a lot of labs. You currently use Richard Photo Lab, and we're always hammering Richard, Richard, Richard. Yeah. And a lot of people use these guys, and it's for a reason, and I'm not doing this as a commercial for Brian and Bill, but really, let's talk about labs because that's a huge thing when it comes to an analog workflow especially for someone that's doing professional work and trying to make money by shooting film. Right. 
You can shoot black and white and soup it in the bathroom and it's all good, right? It's cool. Yeah, and I did for my first few weddings. Yeah, it's always fun, huh? And then I was like, this is a lot of work. It is. So tell me about your experience with other labs and what you're using now and why. Well, I know that everybody keeps bragging about Richard Photolab and it almost seems like we're being paid to say that. But I know from my experience, having worked in labs and I was a professional fiber printer and I was printing for a lot of big name photographers, I know how hard it is to find a good lab and they're definitely having hard times in this day and age because of the diminishing film market. Hopefully that's swinging the other way and people are starting to shoot film again. But Richard Photolab, they've gone the extra mile. Brian and Bill, first thing when I talked to them, they were like, well, we'll spend time with you and we'll get your color right. And I was like, well, I used to color print. I'm super picky. And they're like, it's no big deal. We'll do it. And so I think it took about three weddings. And then we had to tweak it last fall just a little bit. But I actually went to other labs and tried other labs. I don't remember what exactly made I know I tried some other ones in L.A. And then when I moved to Texas, I found other labs just because I wanted to keep it close to home and support local business and find someone local that I could see face to face. And I just didn't find anybody in Texas or in the Midwest. And there's big labs here in the Midwest that are well known and they are not going to do what I need them to do, which is give me custom color. The film looks beautiful coming straight out of the camera, but we all have preferences. And it's funny going back to the day when I used to print my own stuff at the lab, I knew how to dial in what I wanted. I knew how to get what I needed. It's funny, I'm probably a difficult customer because I know what's possible. And Brian and Bill have just totally taken care of me. And if I ever call them and say, hey, this is looking a little weird, they practically jump on it and they fix it. So I absolutely love that lab. And you're as good as your vendors, in my opinion. And I'm steadfastly with Richard Photo Lab at this point. Tell me about proofs. Do you print proofs? Do you do proofs? Do you supply proofs? What's your thoughts on printing? I don't do proofs. I eliminated them. I did that because I wanted people to get albums. And I found that when I gave them proofs, they weren't getting albums. I'm a huge fan of books and albums. I really believe in holding something tangible in your hands. And the book goes back centuries. So it's a time-honored technique that I love. I use Cypress. I use Couture. Couture is a press-printed book. It's amazing. And Leather Craftsman has been around for years, and I'm using them. I've also used Queensberry and Levy. I don't use them as much. Levy is very specific. It's in Japan, and you send images over, and they lay it out. They, like, inlay it into the mat, and they include rice paper around it. It's a very, very interesting, unusual process. But I find that it's hard for people to picture their wedding albums that way. So I really try to keep it simple and classic, and that's Cypress and Couture. Couture has a lot of really interesting cover styles. What's your favorite album? If you had to pick one, there's only one that Susie gets to use from now on. It doesn't matter what it costs. What's your uh-huh. favorite gig? I got to say, I really do like the Couture Toscana, and Earth is the one that I order a lot of. Oh, I know it's Antarctica. That's the name of it. It's got a brown cardboard cover. It's very unwedding. I order like five of those now. Really? Do you find that your clients in Texas or where you're doing stuff, maybe more in the Midwest and the South, are more adapted to that? or people in L.A. area that would want more of that? That's a really interesting question because when I got to Texas, I actually had done zero research on demographics or anything like that. I tend to be very intuitive, so I said, oh, it'll be fine. And I got to Texas, and just shooting was very different. People only got married on Saturdays and in churches and country club ballrooms or hotel ballrooms. And California, I had been used to shooting on the beach, in a museum, in a fancy restaurant. People did very interesting decor, really over-the-top details, really unique. And so I wasn't expecting that. But I still tend to attract a certain kind of client in Texas, even if they're traditional. They're in their 30s, and they have a certain style. So they really responded to the couture books. In fact, the matted books that I have, I can tell right away how they're going to respond to it because they'll look at it and crinkle their nose up and close the book and put it away. And I was really surprised by that. So I wish that I could say I could figure it out like across the board, but generalizing never seems to work. And I've just found the only way I can generalize is that my particular clientele really love unique products. Susie, tell me about your experiences in shooting these weddings and locations from when you lived in L.A. compared to when you lived in San Francisco compared to Austin. What do you find a difference in the brides or is there any? Oh, yes, very much. The first really big difference that I'd never even heard of, very much a Southern tradition, is a bridal shoot. 
which is when about two or three weeks before the wedding, the dress is ready and you go out and you do like an engagement session only just with the bride. Yeah. And then she'll get a 16 by 20 made and they'll put it up at the wedding somewhere. It's very much sort of a debutante kind of thing. I was really freaked out by it because they were relying on me not to get the dress dirty. And at the same time, it was interesting because they did basically a dry run. They did their hair, their makeup, they got a bouquet made. So it was a big deal. It's costly for the bride. And yet a lot of the moms were insisting upon it. So it's like, okay, I guess I have to do this. And it's funny because it actually is a nice little extra bit of income that I didn't expect. And I kind of feel like the other parts of the country might start latching onto this. Just like the trash address thing went through, I think people might go, oh, look at that. That's a way to make a little extra money. So that was an interesting trend. In California, I would do the bridal session on the wedding day. Of course, I couldn't put a 16 by 20 up, but I was used to getting it all done. Things are very action-packed, and I'm very hands-on with timelines so that I can get everything I need. I'm super prepped before I show up to a wedding. So they would want pictures of the two of them in California. We'd go all over the place on the wedding day, and I also could get them to do a first look so we could do all those pictures before the ceremony. And I'm still trying to get people here to understand how valuable a first look is. There's been a lot of resistance to it. And people here, a lot of times, they're like, oh, we just want to do our portraits on the altar where we got married. And I'm like, well, wait, we just shot pictures of you on the altar for 45 minutes during your ceremony. And they're like, no, no, but this is where we got married. And so there seemed to be less desire to be creative with their portraits. Even though they had seen my work ahead of time and said they loved it on the actual day of, they didn't want to do any of that. So that was a huge adjustment for me. It's interesting to talk about the formal bridal portrait a year or two ago or whenever it was at a PPA. Imagine USA show, they had yeah. all the prints up. And in the wedding category, you had seen all the hip and cool OC photographers doing their deal and all yep. this kind of great stuff. And then there was a special set and you could tell there was these extravagant, beautiful, formal bridal portraits. Yep. They were all Asian. Boom, 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 boom. So you yes. could tell by the culture, and especially like you said, in the South, Asian, this is part of the deal. That's what you do. You have a formal bridal portrait. Yeah. This is theory you're one time. Yeah. Any more could be multiple, but really, at <laughs> least the first time, right? It's yep. a big deal. And you have this beautiful bridal portrait done in an extravagant location an yeah. old style lounge chair, whatever. And it's very cool. And I don't yep. see people doing this. And it's great to see that you're finding people that still want this. It really was an interesting thing to find out. I thought, I have to do this? Are you kidding? And I tried to tell them, oh, no, no, I do it on the wedding day. I'll get it all done. And it wasn't that they didn't believe me. They just said, no, 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 we need a picture to go up. I was like, oh, okay. But what about the guy? So interesting, too, that a lot of times it is like somebody sitting in a chair by a window or coming down a long staircase. The mom is usually there. Maybe a sister's there. Everything's very fragile. It's not very open and liberated the way it is when on the wedding day, you've just gotten married. You're like, woohoo, let's go out and do pictures. Well, I mean, really, if you think about it in wedding photography in general, it's not about the guy. I like it to be about the guy. And, and when I yeah. first started, I was second shooting and I love being in with the guys and getting pictures of the guys. When I had to transition to being a primary shooter, that was really hard for me because I never got to be in there with the guys anymore. And now I just really make sure that my second shooter goes the extra mile with the guys and that we know all of the groom's family names because a lot of time the groom's family feels ignored in the whole process. So we go out of our way to really treat the groom and his family extra nice. No, I think that's very cool because like you said, a lot of people don't pay any attention yeah. One of the reasons that I feel like that I have a connection to weddings is I really believe in two people finding each other and being together. And I've been with my husband for 16 years. This is my second husband after the first one. And I just know how much that means to me. And so when I see my couples, I actually am seeing how they are together and I just want to capture that. So it's really hard for me to separate it out and just focus on the bride. Do you find that female wedding photographers are better than men? <laughs> That's a juicy topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, really. I mean, okay, so you're a girl, and I think girls have been raised at least in the 50s. It's a fairy tale thing. It's been bred into the culture. So maybe women have a better grasp on what other women want, or is it something that's an acquired taste and an acquired look by a male photographer? What do you think? Oh, I always like okay. to ask this question because I get such a different variety of answers. It's always cool. Well, okay. So I don't like to generalize, and there are always exceptions to the rule, but I prefer to only have women working with me 
and I've had some very talented guys working with me. And then I've had a lot of guys who were technically proficient, but just their work was sterile. They couldn't connect with what was going on. Is it that they couldn't connect with the environment or they couldn't convey an emotion to the person they were photographing? Was it they didn't know what to look for or was it that they didn't have the personality to really model someone? Or was it even if they were shooting second, they just didn't know what to look for? No, (laughs) I guess I'll expand this to both sexes because it's a good thing to talk about for second shooters. You have to love weddings. And I see a lot of people doing this because they think, oh, I only work Saturdays and I'm going to make this much amount of money. So I've had to fire a lot of people who just never got it. And I just tell them, I say, we're not a good match. And I think you should explore other kinds of photography. And I usually know within like a half a wedding without even seeing their stuff, I can tell. It's frustrating because I'm also now running out of film shooters to second shoot. So I'm having to deal with people shooting digital, which really mucks up my workflow. But I just feel like a lot of the women I've worked with have been sensational But then I know a lot of really great guy photographers, too. So hard to generalize on that. But my first instinct is to hire women. How can you tell when someone's shooting second with you or third or whatever? How can you just tell that they're not into it? Tell me what your thoughts are on somebody being into a wedding and not giving a fly and whatever. Yeah, they look bored and I'll tell them what I need them to do. And they'll kind of do it haphazardly. And these are people with great work ethics. These are not people who are lazy These are people who love photography, but I know I'll tell people during the cocktail, you need to go and get candids. You do that side of the room, I'll do this side of the room. I need you to go up and get lots and lots of candids. And you get their work back and you can tell they just didn't care. If it's not the big exciting moment, they just weren't into it. It's funny too, like we all have strengths. I've had people who were horrible at details, but great at people. And so you just learn. Depending on the wedding, I try to have at least a second photographer and a photo assistant. And a lot of times I'll have a third photographer and a photo assistant. And the photo assistant doesn't shoot. They just take care of us. So I've just seen people not be into it. Or they'll disappear. You'll be like, where's so-and-so? And And you're looking for them. And the other thing is is they'll walk up and stand right next to me and shoot the same thing I'm shooting. And I'll actually tell them beforehand. I say, you need to be opposite wherever I'm at, but not in my shot. You cannot shoot the same thing I'm shooting from the same angle. And then they do it. It's really interesting to me how many times people get that wrong. And I tell people to think about it. I'm very much the Cartier-Bresson school of the decisive moment. And I think digital has really caused people to shoot a lot. And I know from editing their work that it's unnecessary. Ten shots and I pick one. That's just crazy. And people always say to me, like, how do you know you're getting the right thing? And I'm visualizing it. I have a mental inventory of what I'm looking for. And I'm visualizing it. And I don't need to chimp. I know that I've got it, and I'll watch my second shooters shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. I've trained a lot of them to shoot less and to just pick their moments. Well, I mean, really, you don't need to chimp. There's no reason to chimp. I mean, if you know know your basic photographic skills and you're looking for a decisive moment, if you look at the back of the camera, you're going to miss the next moment. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. I've seen people going through their files while something's happening, and I'm shooting it. That cracks me up a lot. I've been the second shooter for somebody and they're going through their files and I'm shooting the moment because they're sitting there looking. So yeah, I really feel like people are losing that skill and I'm trying to train people to get it back and to be in the moment. And it does slow you down to shoot film. And I think it's a good thing. You don't need to document every single thing that's happening, especially the caterers. Look at Rickus Valadares, okay? He's a wedding photographer out of Miami, typically shoots all black and white and a Leica. Wow. 90% of his images, he doesn't even look through the camera. Yeah, with a Leica especially. Well, I mean, he's looking for the moment. He's looking for that decisive, emotional moment. You don't need to look and you don't need to chimp. And I think that the digital stuff, like we've talked, it's great. The technology is cool. You can shoot at ISO 12,000 plus. It's incredible. Okay? Yes. But turn the monitor off if you're going to shoot digital. Put gaffer's tape over the back, man. Learn how to shoot. Yeah, I think that's just something, it's just a trend. And when I have people give me 3,000 or 4,000 images and I've shot 1,200 and I'm the primary shooter, I feel like there's a problem there. I don't want to edit all that. In fact, I had a wedding recently. It was really funny. She couldn't get the files to me. I kept asking her. And meanwhile, I had edited. I'd had her shoot film most of the day and she shot a little digital too. I delivered the wedding. I kind of forgot that she'd shot digital. And I said, hey, by the way, go check it out. I put that wedding online. And she's like, oh, she's like, I still have digital files. And so she gave them to me. And I think she shot like six or 800 digital files. 
and I edited it down to 30 images. So I just snuck them in at the back end. There literally wasn't a lot worth keeping. Her film stuff was beautiful, and I can't even really show these side by side. It's really tough. So, Susie, tell me what you're looking forward to in the future. What do you want to do that you haven't got to shoot, do, wedding, style, genre? What do you want to do that you haven't got to do yet? Ah, cool. I'm up for a wedding in Morocco, and I'd love to get that. That would be a a lot of fun. I want to keep getting really unusual weddings. I have one in Marfa, Texas coming up. It's way out in the middle of nowhere. I also am actually getting ready to start teaching people workshops, and I know everybody's doing that. I know from running my monthly photographers meeting, what I want to teach is I don't want to show people how to shoot or how to shoot film. I want to show them just basic business techniques because I will ask people, so what are your costs? And they don't know. They don't have a spreadsheet. Well, how do you know what to charge? Well, I just picked this number. It sounded good. And they don't even have a DBA. They just have real basic stuff that they don't know. And kind of the reason this came up was there was that whole argument that, well, shooting digital is cheaper than film. How can you shoot film? And I ran all my costs. And for the amount of time I sit and post fixing digital files, it's the same. I don't have to spend five grand or whatever it is on a body. I spend 350 on a camera body and it lasts for years. My costs are, other than the film and the film processing, it's done. And so there's just this misconception. And I'm always trying to teach people the truth. <laughs> it's a losing battle. But I've just tried to get people to understand that their time in front of the computer is not free. And even their time on the wedding day. They're like, well, I can go shoot that digitally and it's free. And I'm like, oh, no, you've got fixed costs on top of your variable costs. And they're like, what are you talking about? So I want to help people with that. I'm really, really sad that people are operating businesses and not knowing this information. So there you go. Maybe a class on analog versus digital and how to succeed in business. Yes. I lead this photographer's group and everybody there knows I've been very out about that. I shoot film. I shoot film. I shoot film. I shoot film. And I've been leading this group for four years in Austin. And I think one guy has started incorporating film back into his workflow. And everybody's always really like envious. They're like, oh, I so wish I could shoot film. And I'm like, you can. It's really easy. You should. And I remember at WPPI, like three years ago, a lot of the lectures were how to get your life back, how to not sit in front of the computer. And I would like sit in those just looking around me going, geez, just shoot film. Shoot film. I have the answer. You don't need all these crazy workflow techniques. Just shoot film. So that's my plug for film right there. So tell me about your user group gig you're doing so people, if they're in the Austin area, they can actually come and join your guys' gig. Absolutely. They can email me to get invited, but it's open to everyone. It's the third Wednesday of each month at 7 p.m. I always have guest speakers. I always have a local photographer do a spotlight on their own studio so we get to know each other better. And I always have Home Slice Pizza and Lone Star Beer, which are two local Texas favorites. And where can they find out about these gigs and when they are? Is this up on a website somewhere? How's that work? I send out invites. And if they email me, that'd be the easiest way I can put them on the list. And my email is suzi, S-U-Z-I, at qweddings.com. It's Q, the letter Q, like Suzy Q. So, Susie, tell me about your blog. That is great. There's tons of killer pictures up here. You're putting stuff up every day. Where can they find this? What you're doing? Where's all the stuff located so people can check out what you're up to? You bet. On my blog, I've been putting up a photo of the day every day since January 1st, 2007. And that is at my website, qweddings.com slash blog. I really feel it's important to show personal work, to show work that is not wedding related. And I will put weddings up there or engagement shoots or anything that I've shot. But most of the stuff that's up there is from my travels. When I do travel gigs, I always add an extra day and I shoot stuff for myself. And I also always tell people, always carry a camera with you wherever you go. And hopefully people will do that. So you do? You carry a camera everywhere you go? Everywhere. I have one with me right now. Really? And I'm about to go meet clients. Apparently, they're sake experts. So I'm going to go meet my clients have some sake, hear about what's going on with their wedding plans. It's coming up in June. And I brought my camera because you bet I'm going to take pictures. And what camera do you carry with you everywhere you go? Well, usually I carry an FM2, which is an old camera. It's all manual. So if the batteries die, I can shoot Sunny 16, which I do quite a bit. Or I'll carry an F100. It's a little bit bigger. It takes a little more room in my purse. I like to look like a normal girl carrying a purse, not look like a photographer. And what film's always stuck in that camera? 800. (laughs) I know there's 800 right now. (laughs) How cool. I checked before I left. I was like, well, I might be outside, but yeah, I got 800 in there. There you go. How cool is that? 
Susie, this has been great. I really appreciate chatting with you. And just great to have you on the program to talk about yourself, your beautiful photography, your use of film. And this is great stuff you're doing. Thank you. I am honored to be in such good company on your show. Well, there you go. Susie Varen, our friend Susie Q. You can definitely check out her delicious photography and all the great stuff she's doing, of course, all on film over at www.qweedings.com. The Inside Analog Photo Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm for their full line of instant cameras and film and, of course, fine quality Fuji Crystal Archive paper over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Our friends at Photo Publicist, Worldwide Publicity, Strategic Promotion, Social Media Marketing, and Business Development over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the finest quality lab in the country, richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5 for black and white chrome at dr5.com. Upstrap for the finest quality camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder at upstrap-pro.com. Our friends over at Iger Studios at igerstudios.com. And, of course, our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group at apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, over at eastmanhouse.org. I've been your host, Scott Chippen, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.